Welcome to the first of a series of videos designed to promote conversations about safety in the telecommunications industry, increase safety for everyone in the industry, and especially for tower climbers. We hope this effort will help employers and workers avoid the tragic and avoidable incidents, injuries, and fatalities we've seen all too often. Our plan is to publish an ongoing series of videos. This one will be a general discussion, and later videos will focus on more specific topics. But first, let me introduce you to today's presenters. I'm Jim Maddox, Director of Construction Safety at OSHA. We also have with us Paula Roberts, Vice President of Compliance for American Tower, John Erickson, Structural Engineer and Chair of the TIA TR14 Committee, the committee that writes the consensus standards for the design, construction, modification, and demolition of towers, and Scott Kisting, Senior Vice President of Muni Tower Service Company and Chair of the TIRAP Board of Directors. TIRAP is the Telecommunications Industry Registered Apprenticeship Program. To get us started, I want to make sure everyone knows that employers have a legal responsibility to provide a safe and healthful work environment for their workers. The OSH Act requires it. Of course, this responsibility includes following the OSHA standards. But to be really safe, employers need to go beyond the OSHA standards implement safety and health programs, make sure they have effective policies and training programs, and supervise their employees in a way that minimizes unsafe actions. We do recognize that employee misconduct may result in a safety issue, but employers need to make sure that they have effective policies, training, and supervision of their employees to minimize unsafe actions. Employers also need to make sure that training is in a language and vocabulary the worker can understand. If workers don't understand the material, they can't comply. Supervisory training is also critical in the safety process. The supervisor is the employer's representative at the construction site. And when the supervisor is the employer's only representative, he or she takes on safety responsibilities for the employer. Extra training on safety management, safety leadership, and safety communication can help them do this duty. In the scheme of things, our industry is still very young. It's in a state of almost constant change. The men and women who do this work always have to be students, as what they are doing today may not be what they will be doing tomorrow. As will be discussed by my colleagues, we have to do a better job in communicating the standards to each member of our industry. This is where the roles and responsibilities become so critically important. We must understand how the standards apply to what we are responsible for and ensure that we know when to refer an issue from a contractor to an engineer or when an engineer should be advising an owner. I'd like to turn to Paul now and ask him a question. You know, Paul, no one would argue that safety is not a critical part of the industry. What needs to be done to improve safety and where do OSHA and the standards bodies fit into this? Okay. I think our basis is educating ourselves and each other in this topic and, and making sure that we as an industry can ensure a self, safe and healthful work environment for our employees. We must focus on and explore every opportunity that we have to improve safety. Our message is that this focus on safety is maybe the most important message in our workforce life because it is their life. Just think about it. We have the capability to work together and improve safety in every facet of our jobs. What an opportunity. To accelerate this improvement, there's some things that we need to do. One of those is to increase our compliance with our industry standards. The other, to take it further, is that we must not only work on our industry standards, but work with our industry associations to ensure that we properly define the and illustrate the expectations for proper tower work. We must embrace OSHA. OSHA has experience not only in the telecom industry, but across multiple industries of varying levels of hazard. We can learn from those things and apply that. So we must embrace OSHA. We must work closely with one another to ensure that we embrace new ideas, new technologies that are showing themselves as we speak. But perhaps most importantly, we need to make sure that we have an attitude that is set in our work force that anyone can stop when they feel that level of risk increase, when they feel that level of discomfort, that the best thing to do is stop, just stop and back away from the task, understand it, and move forward. 
So detect a general theme of increasing our standards knowledge and working closely together for this common purpose. Uh, do you think this can be successful? Yes, I do. Our industry workforce is a very strong workforce. We're a very capable workforce. We will work together, and part of that is understanding each other's roles, responsibilities, adherence to our standards, to make sure that we guarantee a safe environment and a quality work product. We can eliminate these fatalities that we've experienced over the last 15 years or more and of the serious in injuries that plague our industry. We must all embrace the belief that every worker in our industry can go home safely at the end of the day to their family. Together, I'm confident that we will succeed in this venture. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so John, I'd like to ask you, how did we get to this point in the, in the standards and what's the path forward? Well, for the last six years, TIA's have, um, committee has developed a uh, design standard. And over the years, the knowledge of how to build, implement the design standard was passed on from employee employee through know-how. Um, we've recognized recently as the industry has grown rapidly that we need to do something different. And in 2012, we created TIA 1019, which is a standard about the construction and modification of, of structures, new and existing. So what we've tried to do with that standard is to bring in the knowledge of all the different participants so that uh, where they're doing the work in the field, they can do it safely and effectively. We've brought in the contractor, the engineer, the owners, and the regulators to develop that standard. Uh, it's our intent to help create that effective communication tool between those roles so that uh, the safe work environment continues um, going forward. And the, the way we've handled that is we, we set up uh, a means for them to effectively plan and execute the statement of work, the SAL, in the field so that uh, the employees know what they should be doing and what their roles are in the process. Yeah, thanks. And so how can our industry assist in the transfer of this knowledge and, and, and uh, who are the people that need to be involved in that? Well, all of the participants are involved. Uh, the contractor, the engineer, the owners. They all have a specific role in developing the solutions necessary to create a safe environment. Um, 1019 is a means of doing that, but more importantly, it's a communication amongst those various participants that creates that safe environment. The engineers and the contractors have to be willing to talk to each other and ask the proper questions. The owners have to make it obvious to all involved that that's an important part of the process. So is there a part of this issue that's due to the way people are currently working together? Well, we talked about the know-how issue. Um, because the, the, the system is changing and we're developing and we're becoming more sophisticated, the planning process becomes very important. Um, that involves making sure that the contract and engineer, again, communicate effectively to, to create that planning or statement of work that allows the engineer to make sure the structure is safe and the contractor employees to work effort, effort effectively. Okay, uh, thanks, John. Uh, Scott, I'd just like to ask you, how do we ensure that we all know our responsibilities and roles and are accountable uh, for meeting them. You know, that's a great question as we think about it, and that's what we're all talking about here. It's the personal engagement and involvement for us to be able to do what you've asked. That's where we as an industry have to recognize that each and every individual in the industry has the obligation and must apply the courage to stop and apply the sauce when it's necessary. No matter how good of a job we do at planning, Jim, it's still construction and there are going to be change conditions. And it's when these change conditions occur that we have to have the courage and uplift individuals with that courage to apply the sauce. Stop, assess, understand, communicate with one another or with other parties that are involved and then execute. Now this is the real gut check moment of the industry. Paul talked about the fatalities. You've talked about the health. Jack talks about the planning and the sow. This is that moment where the individual is so critically important to us in the industry. And we as an industry have to encourage them to make the right decision, to apply that sauce. Yes, I know you want to go home for the weekend. I know the owner's schedule may be pushing you. I know the boss may tell you to get it done. This is where the courage comes in. And we need to recognize this and lift these people up so they can apply that courage. 
Remember, we must never execute until we have a proper assessment and understand what caused the change condition, we've communicated with the responsible parties involved, and ensure that we're able to execute in a safe and quality manner. This is truly a great time in our industry. When you think about it, we've got everybody coming together. Look at what we have around the table here and all the people that have helped us get to this point as we go forward. You heard Jack talk about the standard from 1959. We're sitting here supporting the American people with world-class telecommunications service, which is allowing us to com com compete economically and in other arenas as well. This is where we have to recognize that what used to be a luxury no longer is. It is actually necessary and essential communications. And as such, we have to recognize that it's important to see it's not just the safety of the telecommunications worker, but of the American people that rely on this necessary and essential communications that we're dealing with. To this end, we as an industry must endeavor to always understand the SOW. As Jack said, it's the statement of work. How do we apply that SOW in accord with the standards to the structure in the safe manner so that we give the American people a system that will truly satisfy everybody involved. This is uplifting of courage and communication of the standards. And together as an industry, I'm truly humbled to see that we're moving in that direction. Hey, uh, thanks gentlemen. At this point, I'd like to thank so many from across industry that have been part of this video series and will be included in upcoming videos. The four of us have been and continue to be humbled by the time treasure and talent that so many are providing behind the scenes. We would encourage you to share this video and join us for the next one in the series. Remember, it's through communications that we will ensure safety and quality for this great industry. If you would like to contact us or provide ideas for future videos, please go to tyrap.org and leave us a message. Additionally, we want to ensure that you are aware of some critical websites to support the industry and they'll be listed in the credits. Thanks for joining us.